Awesome. Uh, welcome. Uh, we, for these next two weeks, and then we're going to skip a couple because of a couple things, uh, Ash Wednesday being one of them, but then, uh, then four more weeks in, in March, we're going to spend six weeks talking about our faith and our health. And so my goal today, just so you know before we get into it, my goal is not to answer all of your questions today. My goal today is actually to stir up a bunch of questions so that you leave here interested in coming back. Because each of the following weeks, um, it will not be just me. We will also have a guest. Uh, one of our guests is sitting in the back, which is nice. Hey there, thank you. Um, uh, and each week, we're going to talk about a different aspect of uh, health, what it means. And we're going to talk to somebody who knows more than I do about what their perspective is on it. And uh, I think it's going to be a really wonderful um, program. That's my hope. And I hope that you get something out of it. As we get towards the end of today, one of the things you can be thinking about is what questions you have. And I'm going to write them up here. And uh, that way, when I'm looking forward to like the last couple of weeks, I can be thinking about what sorts of things you'd like to reflect on together. Um, but before we get into it, oh, and it, it will require some participation. So when I ask questions, um, almost all of them are not rhetorical. Every, every now and then I'll let a rhetorical question slip, but generally I really do want your, your, your input. Um, yeah, let's, uh, let's pray. Let's pray for uh, this, this time together and for the weeks to come and um, uh, that God would be with us in this time. Loving God, we thank you, um, that, you that you love us, that you, you pour yourself out for us, that you reveal yourself to us in your Son, that you empower us by the Holy Spirit, and you do all of this for your glory. And, and, uh, and, and Jesus said that you came that we might have life uh, and life to the fullest. And so help us to explore all the ways that our lives can be uh, full and, um, and, uh, and, and all the ways that you hope for us um, to live together uh, in our physical bodies. Um, uh, the, the, the kinds of things that you desire for us, reveal those desires to us in this time. Um, bring us closer to one another and closer to you. Um, and we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. So, there's probably a lot of reasons why this topic was buzzing around our congregation. Um, one of which is that uh, we have a, a health committee that's regathering and hoping to give us, present us with opportunities uh, to become a more physically healthy congregation. Um, uh, we are hopefully heading towards the tail end of a global pandemic, which has a lot of people thinking about what it means to be healthy, how to stay healthy, how we can help keep one another healthy. Um, and so as I was um, thinking about um, something to teach on, I kept coming up against uh, faith and health and how those things interact with one another and how, um, uh, how we as, as people of faith can approach ideas around health. And so my first question to you is, um, what is health? What do we mean when we use the word health? What kinds of health are there? What do you guys think? There's physical health, yeah. Mental health. Absolutely. Spiritual health, right? Having a healthy outlook on our faith is helpful. Well-being. Yeah, just, just general well-being. Yeah, that's another one of, the, one of the ways that I like to talk about health is, is to just use the word well-being, right? Um, uh, when, we, when we tie health too tightly to things like um, health care and health insurance and health, you know, that, that word gets snugged up against a whole bunch of really specific ideas. And I want to broaden it a little bit. And I want us to think about what it means to seek well-being in all these different um, areas of our lives. And so, um, yeah, I think that health uh, is a broad term that, uh, that uh, yeah, I think well-being is a good way of talking about it. Um, here are the four areas that I want us to think about over the next six weeks. I want us to think about our physical health. Um, what does it mean to be uh, an embodied, faithful person? And what does it mean to care about our physical health and, and the physical health of, of our neighbors? Um, what are the ways that we can 
you know, live our lives that uh, support our physical health, that support our neighbors and their physical health. Um, I don't know, but we'll talk about it. Uh, and our mental health will be another thing we're going to look at. That'll actually be next week. Um, next week we'll be, I'll be bringing in a, uh, a mental health uh, expert of sorts, um, uh, Jenny Craddock, who uh, ha has worked with a number of organizations in our community, but right now is um, helping the, um, the free clinic here in Anderson to develop um, some mental health support um, for people who may not be able to afford it otherwise, which I think is really wonderful. We're going to talk with her about her joint journey and how she understands her mental health to be related to her faith, um, which is great. And I'm going to share a little bit about my journey with mental health as well. Um, I want to talk about emotional health a little bit. We don't often think about about this as a separate thing, but but uh, you know your your mental health in is in my in my read it can, can be a physical thing, right? We can have things like hormone imbalances, and um, we can have things like uh, ad addictions and things that can affect our mental health that are that are physical, physiological. Um, but then there's something, in my opinion, to being emotionally healthy, to being able to recognize the ways we feel, and to name the way we feel, and that can help us act in more uh, healthy ways with our families, with our spouses, with neighbors and friends, if we can. Um, we can develop some emotional health. Not that there are good or bad emotions. All emotions are just things that our bodies are telling us, right? But uh, are there ways that we can uh, recognize and respond to them that are more or less healthy, right? Um, uh, and in our spiritual health, what, what resources does our faith have to say that um, can help us develop the kind of uh, spirituality that uh, creates more health for us and for our families and friends and neighbors? So those are kind of the four areas I'm hoping to look at. Um, give me a head nod if you're tracking. Is there something I've skipped? Is there something you really want us to talk about that maybe a, you don't think falls under one of those? Yeah. Could emotional health include how we are socially healthy? And I don't know any other word to use except socially healthy. Sure. Relationships. Yes. Um, groups, feelings of loneliness, feelings mm -hmm. of needing companionship, would that be under emotional? Yeah, yeah I, yeah, I think so. Emotional health could be, you know, maybe another way of talking about that might be like relational health. What does it look like to be, have healthy relationships with other people? Yeah, that could be something else we could talk about for sure. I'm going to make a note of that. Mm. Yeah. Yes, in my opinion. Mm, yeah. Because that's from Satan. Mm. Yeah. That's just something that popped in my head. Sure. Yeah, I, there, there's a lot of really good research on, on shame. Um, and I do think that there are unhealthy aspects of shame, especially when it's coming from um, a, a place of self-degradation. Like if you, if you feel the feeling that comes up of like embarrassment, for me, shame is like the response of then beating yourself up or... or telling yourself you're a bad person or, or giving in to peer pressure around you because you're being shamed, you know? Um, but yeah, you're, you're, there, are, uh, there, are, there are feelings that can t lead us in unhealthy ways. Um, my, my best understanding from what I've read, and, and the, my experience is just with um, a chaplaincy and CPE, is that um, a shame response is something we have to a feeling. So maybe, maybe, maybe what I should say is all feelings are information. There are no good or bad feelings. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, we can, we can feel a feeling and then react in shame. Um, and I, I do think that that can be really unhelpful. Um, yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. I agree. Um, yeah. Uh, here's, here's, just so you know where I'm coming from, my theological premise is that God cares about us. And that when I say God cares about us, I don't just mean our souls. God doesn't just care about our spiritual selves. Our spiritual selves and our physical selves are not fully separable in my mind. In the same way that Jesus was fully God and fully human, I believe that I am fully all of the things that I am. And part of that is a physical body. Um, and we can talk uh, about how that's fuzzy and how that doesn't always work out. Um, but uh, the reason I believe this is because of Jesus, 
right? Jesus, uh, the incarnation uh, is, a, is a way that God shows us that um, it's important to come to us in a physical body to experience the things we experience. Uh, and Jesus was resurrected in a physical body. And, and, I, and I believe that that's a sign to us, that God cares about our physicality. Um, but uh, not, all, not all Christians throughout history have thought this way. And uh, here in a minute, I'm going to talk about a, uh, a particular uh, brand of Christianity that's, been with, that's sort of gone alongside more Orthodox Christianity the whole time. Um, but anyway, we'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, here's, a, here's a scripture passage for us. If, we, if you were to turn, don't turn, but if you were to turn to 1 Corinthians 6, you would be reading a polemic against, uh, uh, against sexual immorality. But within this polemic against sexual immorality, uh, Paul talks about how the reason he cares about uh, ha us having uh, healthy uh, sex lives uh, is actually because God cares about our physical bodies. He says, do you not know that your body is a temple? That your body is a temple of the Lord, of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. And he starts this polemic uh, by saying, all things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. So he's encouraging folks to think about the things that we do with our bodies. Are they beneficial to us or not? And I sometimes don't ask myself that question. Sometimes I, uh, uh, I, I, I eat something or do something or, or take a risk or, uh, you know, just lay around all day. And then I feel worse, right? I feel worse after I've done the thing than I did before. And Paul might say, well, just because you can doesn't mean you should, all right? There, there might be ways for us to grow in more health uh, physically, our physical bodies. Um, do you guys ever think about, have you ever heard somebody tell you your body is a temple? When someone might share, what, like, what was the context of that? What, it was, what, what was the message there when, when you were told your body is a temple? Mm, yeah. That, that from the church's perspective, right? Now, you know, it's framed in terms of the Christian perspective. Mm -hmm. that your body's a temple, and right. So putting those things in your body is going to harm it, and we don't want to harm something that is holy and loved. And, and uh, uh, temples are, are are sacred places; they're set apart, right? Um, so yeah, we don't want to do things that harm our bodies. When I when I was told my my body is a temple, it usually had to do with Things like drugs or alcohol, things like uh, eating too much, things like being in good physical shape. Uh, I think that metaphor is that. That's a part of it. But I also think it's deeper than that. Because it says that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you. So, uh, so what are things that temples, what do we do in a temple? Another, t another translation would be sanctuary. What do we do in a sanctuary? Worship. We worship. Yeah, my body is a site of worship. I can worship God in my physical body. Uh, what else do we do in a sanctuary? We glorify God. We, we praise God. We talk to God. We listen. We learn from God. Have you ever learned anything from your body? I hope so. I, I, don't, know, I, don't, know that, I don't know that I have, but my body is telling me things all the time. I stand up off the couch and I'm like, oh, maybe I shouldn't sit like that anymore, you know? Uh, that's my body telling me something, and I think I think that's a our bodies are a way that God can speak to us. Another thing that kind of goes along with this temple to me is is why, why we care because we want to be able to serve God yeah. to our, the best of our ability. And if we don't have the strength, if we don't have the perseverance, if we don't, I'm not saying everybody's got the same physical uh, attributes or gifts, but we want to be able to be fit service. We want to be able to do things with our body that we're, that in service of God. Yeah. Yeah. And we want to honor the temple that we've been given. Uh, it's, a, it's a gift for us to steward. Uh, you are not your own, it says at the end of this chapter, right? You've been bought with a price. We, we in our whole bodies, we belong to God. And so, uh, yeah. Well, you know, one of the questions I want us to ask is, um, you know, what does it mean to honor a body who's different than mine? What, what does it mean for, what if someone's temple is paralyzed? What if someone's temple is uh, um, 
I, I don't know, uh, too tall or too short or too big or too small. Sure, yeah, but but can we can we honor someone's body that they've been given um, and help them to 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 live that? I guess what I'm saying is someone else's experience of their temple might be different than mine, and that's okay. That doesn't mean that like theirs is bad and mine is good, right? Um, anyway, uh, yeah. So our body is a temple. Uh, things that uh, huh? Wait a minute. There we go. Uh, temples are good. Your body is good. The end of Genesis chapter 1, God made humans and God declared it very good. Your body is good. Your body is a site of worship for God. Uh, you can hear God. Uh, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm praying, uh, something's happening in my brain. <laughs> right? It's part of my body that I'm experiencing. Right? Um, uh, temples are not for sale. Uh, my body is not a commodity to be traded, uh, to be bought and sold. Um, and temples are holy and sacred and set apart. So those are just some things I was, I've, I've reflected on when I was thinking about this metaphor of our, our body as a temple. Um, and I said I was going to talk about um, a, kind of, uh, a kind of Christianity that was uh, declared a heresy in about the third century, but has never gone away. It's never gone away. And have you guys heard, uh, what, is there a word that comes to mind? Maybe not, maybe not. Have you ever heard the word Gnosticism or Gnostic? It starts with a G, Gnostic. Um, Gnosticism uh, was an offshoot of uh, Platonic, Platonic, like Plato, uh, Platonic philosophy that took some Christianese, and this has happened throughout history, right? Someone with something takes words from Christianity and puts it on top of a different philosophy, right? And one of those philosophies was Gnosticism. And uh, Gnosticism has some particular traits about it. Um, Gnosticism, uh, oh yeah, uh, it's been called uh, the first and most persistent of Christian heresies. Uh, and before I get into this, there are lots of different views within Christianity. Uh, you may hold some of these views. I may have hold them in the pa held them in the past. Your friends do. This is not, I'm not here to judge people who believe different things than me. Uh, I just want to lift up some things that were pushed back against in the early church. Um, they have a dualistic anthrop anthropology. So, uh, so Paul would say, your body is good and important. And in the end, it will be raised up with Christ, just like Christ's body. Right? Uh, that that we, are, we are embodied beings, Paul would say, and the church would affirm. Uh, a Gnostic Christian, early Gnostic Christian writings would say, your body is bad. Everything about it. Not just... Not just um, worldly temptations and bad things, right? Not just things like sexual immorality or slavery, like not just those bad things with your body, but actually your whole body, your arm. Your arm is bad, your ear is bad, it's all bad. The only thing that's good is your spirit, and your spirit is this second thing. And the spirit will be liberated from the body to go somewhere else. That's what Gnostic Christians believed. Um, does that make sense? Um, so there are there are lots of writings. There are there are gospels that have been written uh, around the time. The Gospel of Judas is one of them. There were there were lots of Christian writings floating around in the first two or three centuries of the church, and we didn't have a Bible formed yet. We had some councils uh, to decide that. But there were there were lots of um, Christians who believed that um, uh, when 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 Paul would they would take things like Paul saying. Uh, it is, if I die in Christ, it is gain. And they would say, well, let's just all go die <laughs> because my body is bad, right? Um, but that, that comes, in my opinion, from Plato. Uh, Plato believed there was the world of forms and there was, this, there was this world that we live in, which is broken and bad and, and is unredeemable, right? He thought our physical world was unredeemable, whereas I believe Jesus came because we are redeemable and the world is redeemable. Yeah. Something underneath to punish their body because their body is inherently bad, or self flagellate. Have you ever heard of Christians who do self flagellate? Yeah, that's why I asked what it looked like. Yeah, yeah. So it looked, it, 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 it didn't, it didn't look the same. And another thing I should say about Gnosticism is uh, Gnosticism wasn't its own religion. 
So there were lots of different Christianities popping up, and some of them had these characteristics, but no one was going around like, I'm a Gnostic Christian. But there were some Christians who were self-flagellating, who were starving themselves, who were, right? There were other Gnostic Christians who, because they thought the body didn't matter, they were just running around and having orgies, and they were just eating whatever they want. They were hedonistic. So it, so it, it takes on two different forms. There's the form that's like uh, self-denial and reject self-rejection, and then there's the like, what does it matter? Let's just eat, drink, and be merry and not care, right? So it took different forms. Um, but yeah, the dualistic anthropology just means they believed body, bad, spirit, good. Um, uh, and they had a dualistic theology. So uh, this shows up in modern Christianity all the time. I was brought up with parts of it. I'm not going to get too big into it. We can talk about it later. But they believed that there was like a real God. And then there was a, a, a demi-God who made our world. And that the reason our world, and we, the reason we were trapped in these physical bodies was because a lesser God made our physicality. So everything that was material is bad. Um, this is why it's important that we hang on to the Old Testament so we can <laughs> reflect on the, 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 the growth of Christianity out of Judaism, right? Where we know that the world was, called, was made and called good. But they believed um, that once we escaped our physical bodies in this physical world, we would go live with the good God. Uh, that God, they called the God the, a monad, uh, and they called the bad God a, a demi, demiurge. Just, you don't need to know that. But, um, but then, throughout history, there are types of Christianities. Uh, I, I went to a church one time with the girl I was dating in high school, and they talked about Satan more than they talked about Jesus. And you would think that Satan was a God, right? And it's very tempting to look at our trials and troubles in this life, and instead of saying, this is a brokenness that can be healed, to say, uh, uh, this is, this is an, a, a something that's outside of me and it's acting against me and it's going to beat me, right? And if only I could escape it, right? But we don't have to escape it. We are being healed of it in Christ. There's a unification happening. Um, anyway, uh, I may have already said too much. But dualistic theology. God was not, there was a God, but there were also other godly forces that were higher than humans. All right? uh, there's also an emphasis on gnosis. This is actually where the word comes from. Uh, it comes from the word gnosis, which means a gnosis is a secret knowledge. Um, so at, if you came to a, a, Gnos a church that was dabbling in Gnosticism, the, the pastor would say, if you stay here for four years and you live under our tutelage eventually, the spiritual truth will be revealed to you, and only we have it, and it's a secret, right? And you'll find it out. Um, it was an emphasis on, on secret knowledge, and, and, and that knowing the secret knowledge was salvific. So you, you, would, be, you would be saved into your spiritual body by knowing uh, a secret. These, these, are, these are signs that we recognize in cults today. When you, when you hear about a cult leader who withholds information, has tighter and tighter inner circles around them, usually him, right? Um, that's, that's, a, that's a Gnostic form of religion because it just means that there's a secret knowledge that not everybody has and that that secret knowledge will save us. We don't believe that we're saved by knowledge. We believe we're saved by Jesus and that the saving has happened in Christ Jesus, not in, not in some secret uh, thing I have to know or not know, right? All right. Uh, secret, hidden, mystical knowledge that most people aren't ever gonna. Most people aren't gonna know, but you know, you're special. <laughs> you're special, and you're gonna know, and but everybody else is not gonna figure it out because they're they're not as smart as we are, right? You see the dualism that's happening there, in group, out group stuff. Uh, here are some Christian theological correctives. The early church in the 300s and 400s at their councils said. Um, there are many aspects to a person, but Christ has saved the whole person, bodies included. Bodies are good. We're not going to be freed from our bodies, and then, you know, your body's not bad, right? Uh, uh, and they had a unified theology. There aren't multiple gods. God is not fighting other gods. There's just, there's just the one God in three persons, right? They affirm the Trinity. There's one Trinitarian God, and that God made the world and made humans and called it good. And it has since been broken, and we see the ways that it's been broken, but it's being redeemed and healed in Christ. Does that make sense? Uh, and there's an emphasis on revelation. Not hidden secret knowledge, 
but more and more revelation. Uh, we know who God is because of Jesus. And God, uh, Jesus did not, uh, is not intending to hide ourselves, but to tell everybody. He said, go and make disciples of all nations. Go, shout it to the rooftops. There's, uh, the knowledge is not secret. Everyone should know. <laughs> go tell everybody, right? Um, so those are, those are some pushbacks um, to, uh, to Gnosticism. And the only reason I went down this Gnostic rabbit hole, thank you for coming with me, is because God cares for our bodies. God cares for our bodies. And it is so tempting. Why, you know, why might, why, why, do, why, would, why do they call Gnosticism a persistent heresy? It's because no one wakes up and comes to church and thinks, I want to have Gnostic beliefs. But actually, it's super tempting to just be like, it's too hard in my physical body. I just, my body must just be bad, right? And they're very, they're very easy to accept half-truths. You know, these dualisms are half true. God is good. That is true. It's the my body is bad part that's not, right? Uh, uh, God, made, uh, God uh, made the world and we all want to return. We're going to return to God and God is drawing all people to God's self. That is true. Um, though the world was not made by another sub-God, <laughs> right? That would be easy to believe. Um, yeah, anyway. Does that make sense? It's still very tempting. There are lots of... Uh, um, lots of ways that this shows up in, in our theologies today, and um, that doesn't make us bad people. <laughs> it just makes us people who are trying to figure it out, right? Um, all right. And the last thing I wanted to talk about was uh, shalom. Uh, shalom gets translated a number of different ways, but most commonly, it gets translated peace. And I think that's really good. If you had to pick one word, I think that peace is probably the best one word. Uh, maybe wholeness might be a slightly better one. I'm not sure. But the problem with translating shalom as peace throughout all of Scripture is that um, it, it, flatten, it flattens it. Shalom is a richer and fuller and deeper concept than I think that one word gets. Um, does that make sense? What are, what are some ways that, that just the word peace could be interpreted that aren't as full as, as shalom? One way would be uh, if we think of peace as just the absence of conflict. You know, if peace is just like, I woke up in my bed and nobody bothered me all day. Well, that's not really shalom. That might be quietude. It might be, uh, you know, it's, it might be peaceful in a, in a calm sense, but it's not peace, because peace involves everything being in its right place, right? Uh, uh, sh the concept of shalom is the world as it, ought, as it ought to be. The world as God intended is a world full of shalom. So other ways that it gets translated are, are words like wholeness, fullness, completeness, uh, wellness, perfection. Does that track? So when you're uh, reading particularly in the Old Testament. And we, you know, we think of um, these, uh, these words like peace and justice as though they're, they're different. Um, but really, uh, peace is something that is present when the world has been made just. And then, then we have real peace. Uh, a lot of the, the pieces that we settle for uh, these days are really, are really half. It's half peace. You know, it's the peace of having a weekend before I go back to a job I hate. Or it's the peace of, um, you know, taking a nap before I get up and suffer through something painful. Or it's the, it's the peace of getting away from a, from a bad relationship. But it's not, the, it's not the shalom of being in a healthy relationship. Does that make sense? Um, so one of the reasons I think it's important for us as Christians to reflect on our faith and our health um, is so that we can keep challenging ourselves to think about wellness and wholeness and health in a, in a full way, in the same way that God describes uh, the, the, the thing God wants for us. The thing God wants for us is shalom, right? Um, yep. And that shalom encompasses all aspects of our life, our relationships, our physical health, our mental health, our relationships with our neighbors, um, Have I, have I said enough? 
questions at this point? I feel like I've been talking a lot. All right. Uh, I have a quote for you. Um, one of the one of the troubles of talking about health, like we've been talking about, is that everyone's uh, faith journey, as well as everyone's journey with with these healths that we're talking about, is different and unique. And what is uh, good and healthy for one person may not necessarily be good and healthy for another. If 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 uh, Lauren has low blood pressure, and I don't think she would mind me telling you that. Uh, I do not have low blood pressure. My family tends the other way, right? And, uh, you know, when her doctor tells her, like, salt your food more heavily, <laughs> you know, I, that, that's healthy for her. It's not healthy for me, right? Um, and so our, our journeys in these things look, uh, will look different. And, um, yeah, and one thing we can expect in this life is some unwholeness, some suffering, some pain, some something not being right. And that is because we do not live in the world of shalom that God is calling us toward. We, we're not there yet, right? We live in this tension between what we know God wants for us and the way the world just is right now. The world just is like this, and we know that God wants it to be like this, but it's not that yet. And so, um, one, of my, one, of my, uh, one of my favorite priests, uh, is a guy named Henry Nouwen. Uh, and Henry Nouwen wrote a, wrote a book called The Wounded Healer. And in it, he describes what it means to seek healing for ourselves and others uh, in a world where we are all but promised wounds. Right? We're not going to... We're, we're not going <laughs> to... Uh, I can't remember the movie. The tough thing about life is you'll never make it out alive. <laughs> all right? There's, something's going to happen in your life, and there will be some suffering. Um, and so he wrote that no one escapes being wounded. We are all wounded people, whether physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. That's where I got my four categories. <laughs> uh, the, the main question is not, how can we hide our wounds? This gets a bit to your shame, your shame thought uh, earlier, Debbie. Um, it's not how can we hide our wounds so that we don't have to be embarrassed, but how can we put our woundedness into the service of others. When our, when our wounds cease to be a source of shame and become a source of our healing, then we have become wounded healers. Um, yeah. Uh, it's okay to share our journeys towards wholeness with other people and to do so without, without shame. Uh, I, I was inspired by Dennis's sermon on Sunday where he pointed out that um, you know, this man uh, who had been, uh, you know, laying by the pool for 38 years, uh, it was not his fault <laughs> that he was laying there for 38 years. It didn't make his wounds, did not make him a worse person than anybody else. Uh, he needed some help. He needed some healing. He needed some people to show up and recognize his humanity. Um, but, uh, but, but when we ourselves find ourselves in the place where we're, we're laying by a pool and we can't help ourselves... That's okay, um, because God and, and Christ will come alongside us um, and, and help us through those things. But, um, yeah, we don't have to be ashamed of our struggles and things that we come for. And actually, in, in sharing our struggles and our journeys, we grow stronger together. One of the things studies say um, is that if all you do is hop on your Instagram and say, uh, I lost 30 pounds, hooray for me then you get a lot of uh, so positive social feedback. Um, but that doesn't help other people become more healthy. What helps other people become more healthy is when you go, I had a really hard time with this thing. And it was, it was so tough. And I didn't realize that, I'm, I'm having trouble with an example, but I, I didn't realize that the oil I was cooking in was, had so many calories, right? And so I, I was really struggling. And when, and when you share how you overcame that struggle, that will help somebody else. Right? And if we just hide our struggles from one another because of shame or embarrassment or whatever it may be, um, we, we, we're not stepping into that role of, he, of uh, wounded healer, uh, as Henry now puts it out, or um, uh, whereas, I, whereas I think Christ exampled for us. When Christ uh, came back and uh, met with the disciples, 
they locked all the doors and there he was standing in the middle of the room. He still had his wounds, right? His wounds weren't gone. They were there because they were part. They were part of the story. And the whole story is important, even the wounds. Um, so yeah, perfect health from start to finish is not the goal. What is the goal for our, for our time being is to find wholeness even through, even through the suffering and the struggles and the wounds and the cancer diagnoses and, and all, all these things that are, you know, what, if, if it's not you, it's going to be somebody you love, you know? Um, and that's just, that's the way life is in this broken, fallen world at the moment, right? But can we persevere through that and be open with one another about how it is we're suffering and uh, what it is we need uh, so that we can be healed together? Uh, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, for me, I hate suffering. It's the worst. I would, I, I would prefer to just be comfortable. <laughs> but, it, but it seems that the shape of the gospel is acknowledging the ways that I'm suffering, experiencing the pain of others around me and myself, and being brought through that to wholeness. So it's something we're brought through together uh, by God. So do not fear, as they say. That's what I have. And we have five more minutes. And so uh, thank you for your attentiveness, but I would love to hear from you. What are some questions that were brought up in our talk, either about Gnosticism or about Shalom uh, or about being a wounded healer? Uh, is there a thought that came up, a question that you would love to talk about at a future, uh, at a future gathering, at a future study? Is there something you want to make sure we hit over these next uh, six weeks or so? Mm-hmm. whatever that they feel like they'll be totally embarrassed if somebody finds out yep. what they're going through mm-hmm. because they need to talk you know get and I think that's probably what Jenny's going to that'll probably be something she really focuses on next week yeah we'll, we'll, we'll bring that next week for sure um, and, and, and it, the approachability of a person that looks like they've got it totally all together mm-hmm. it's very hard you can't you can't approach that type of person so how do you show your vulnerability in order to, you know, I'm going through some stuff. I'm yeah. going through this and to be open. Yes, I'm going through it or I've been through it or someone I love very deeply has been through it. Um, well, I don't understand exactly what you're going through, but I have had this happen to me yeah. and, and I'm, I'm happy to talk because sometimes it's easy. It's like the perfect Instagram family, mm-hmm. you know, Images of that, and you know, images of you know the airbrush bodies, and you know all that stuff that we know is yep. real. But still, what is it doing to us? The way we think. Yeah, intellectually, I know nobody's perfect, right. Right. but all the all the world does is put all these perfect people in front of me. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Supposedly. Right. Yep. Well, in the crisis that we are having, particularly with adolescent girls. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, it can really mess young folks up to tell them, to have the, the, the society telling them on the one hand that you have to be like physically attractive and you have to, be, you have, to have a, a perfect physical body, but then on the other hand, they're being told by other parts of society that like your bodies are bad and dangerous and if you show your bodies, bad things are going to happen. All right, so they're getting, these, they're getting these mixed messages. And how do we help them develop a healthy sense of self a healthy, uh, a healthy respect for their bodies, a healthy respect for their temples, uh, and 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 uh, you know keep ourselves from um, pu- putting a, uh, uh, putting things into our bodies, into our minds that uh, are, are going to harm our mental health, that are going to make us, that are going to uh, challenge our self-esteem and our self, uh, our self-awareness, right? Um, Gospel of success and how, how 
address kids ages, I'll say, 12, 13 to 25, how stressed those kids are, mm -hmm. thinking they have to achieve a certain something, and if they don't achieve it, they're no good with, with you know, academics and, and even athletics to some extent. And the high suicide rate among males, I think I'm saying this right, 18 to 30. It's 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 endemic almost. And it usually happens when they're no, I can't say usually. I've heard of it a lot happening when they're off at college and they're struggling. Mm -hmm. I've heard I've heard of it happening a lot. Yeah. So that's all tied in. Yeah, what 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 if the church were a place where if you were feeling some unhealth in your mental health or your emotional health or your physical health, that you could come and tell somebody about it? You know, and you can come and talk about it, and, and and the church could be a place where you were directed to resources, offered support groups. You know, we have we have these kinds of groups. We have grief groups and uh, you know support meetings. We've got favor right across the street. Um, but if people don't feel safe enough to access those things, um, you know, then I think the church is letting folks down. Yeah. Um, I've taken a few of those things down. We'll talk about those. We'll talk about relational health a little bit. Um, I hope you'll feel free uh, between now and next week. Shoot me an email if a question pops into your brain. Um, uh, next, next week's pretty set in stone. Uh, and then we're going to take two weeks off, which I hate to do in the middle of a series. But after Ash Wednesday, which we will have a service at this time for Ash Wednesday, um, a worship service. So I hope you'll still come. Uh, but then after Ash Wednesday, we'll have four more, uh, four more weeks um, we're going to speak to some of the uh, chaplains at AnMed about our, how our spiritual health can support our physical health and what it looks like to care for someone spiritually through physical health challenges. And um, uh, it's going to be really fun. So I'm really grateful. I think it's really important. So I'm glad you're here. Um, I'll close this in prayer if that's all right. Loving God, we thank you that you've brought us together this evening. We ask that you continue to uh, inspire us by your spirit and lead us in the ways of Christ so that we can continue to grow into that shalom that you desire for us. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, friends.